church. Please turn your Bibles with me in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. Let's go to the book of wisdom. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 22. And if you're here today and you're new, my name is Frank and this is my sister Trinity. <laughs> And if, it's, and if you guys are there, we're going to start reading. And it says, But a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. So I will cover the later, the latter half of that. And my sister Trinity would cover up the first half. But a crushed spirit dries up the bones. I was really thinking about it. What are some things that crushes our spirit? You know, what are the things that dries it up? I don't know, maybe for the units, for the students, the uni students, it's going back to uni. Maybe it's not having, a, I don't know, a 365 day vacation. Um, maybe for the workers, it's not getting enough rest, not getting enough sleep. Maybe even being lonely. Not having any friends, not having someone to talk to. I know some. I know some people that can have all the money, all the position, but when they don't have friends to share with, it can really crush them. And I think about other things such as fear. Fear can dry up the bones, or maybe insecurity. Maybe for some of us, I know that that was something that I struggle with as well. Insecurity has this thing where it can really. You want to share something, you want to, we know when someone tells you something and you want to say something but you're not really sure because you want to please them, yeah. even those things can crush up your spirit. Yeah. And with that I'm going to just, uh, yep, uh, so whenever there's a problem, there's always a solution and I'll let my sister Trinity <laughs> give that. I am the solution. <laughs> Um, and I love this scripture because not only is it very biblical, but it's also really practical as well. It is definitely that time of year where everyone's prone to sicknesses. <laughs> and I'm sure some of you are victim to it as well. Um, feeling down, weak, disheartened, some of what um, Frank shared. So what's more healing than God's word? And even more when we're cheerful about it. It's pretty cool actually, um, fun fact for everybody. Um, laughter releases endorphins that boost our overall well-being. So if some of you believe that God's word is not true, believe it. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I love laughing. I feel like it's one of the best feelings in the world and it's almost like when you're laughing, you temporarily kind of forget about everything else that you were even worried about to begin with. So to be with God pe uh, God's people and to be with God and living according to his word is when we're at our deepest level of joy, which essentially means to be blessed. So I'm so grateful to be here with everyone on Sunday to laugh, rejoice, praise, worship God, um, to not only heal our physical health, but our spiritual health as well. And so... <laughs> All right, Pam. And with that, we would like to welcome you to the, the Oakland, Oakland International, International Christian Church Sparky Service. <laughs> Let's go into a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, I thank you so much for all of us who are here today. I pray that you please be with us, God, and I pray for the hearts of people to be glad and to be joyful as they sing to glorify you, Father, sing um, to praise you, God, because of your grace, because of your amazing love for us today. I pray that you please be with our service and please be with our hearts. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, everybody. My name is Pate Ito. Um, I don't know why I told you my full name. <laughs> But today I have the privilege of talking about communion. And uh, basically what communion is, is the idea of what does the cross mean to me in this moment, as, in this moment as my life is. You guys get the gist of it. <laughs> so please everyone turn your Bibles to Hebrews 5 verse 7. So I'll give you guys three seconds. Okay, I'm assuming everyone's there. In Hebrews 5 verse 7. It reads, and it reads, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, 
he offered up prayers and petition with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard by his reverent submission, because of his reverent submission. I guess the, the idea or the question is what does, this, what does the cross mean to me as of right now? The cross is a symbol of many things one could say. But for me in my journey with Christ right now, the cross means desperately clinging on to God. Jesus suffered torture. To give you guys an idea, that's flesh being ripped from his body and then nails being punched through his hands and legs. Jesus, even in severe pain, did not cling on to drugs, as some do, to numb the pain. But Jesus clinged, grasped onto the word of his Father. Like the verse says, he offered up prayers and petition with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. Jesus cried in his prayers. He submit himself. He desperately clung to the Father. And God delivered because Jesus was saved because of how, who he desperately clinged on to. Um, sleep for me, as of right now, is a very satisfying thing. And a lot of you might be wondering why, why picking sleep. Um, <laughs> Because I'm not sure if most of you know this, before, before I came to this church, I was in the military for about two years. And um, sleep was a very, sleep was a very um, tough thing, to say the least. Um, I can't really explain to you guys the struggle of sleep. Um, I don't really know how to explain to you guys the difficulty of just sleeping, especially during the military. Um, especially for me, there was, there was like a million voices racing through my head. Um, a lot of the voices would end, would tell me to end it right now. Um, a lot of the voices would, would just, just, it was just a lot of, it was a really dark moment. And, and sleep was, uh, was hard to obtain. Um, so instead of, instead of clinging on to God, because I didn't know who God was at the time, I clinged on to alcohol, uh, drugs, and women. Um, which I found a lot of satisfaction in because I could easily numb out the voices in my head. Um, and amen, uh, I went through that period of time where, where I clinged on to those things so desperately and grasped onto them. And I found that it really, it really wasn't satisfying. It was, so, it was so tiring because you couldn't really, you couldn't really be, it wasn't really fulfilling. You, you'd always want more of it. You'd always want the next. You always want the next drug, or you always want the next alcohol, or you want the the, the next woman. Or it was just it was just a consistent cycle of, of of just you trying and trying and trying and trying and trying and trying and trying. And then, um, yeah. Uh, I guess yeah. I guess that's the point. But one one thing that I did find in my journey with Christ is that humans are nas are naturally desperate. We need something or someone to cling to. We need something or someone. We need something or someone. Once I realized how, once I realized what I was so desperately clinging on to would fall, as I have, I, like a dog, back into a corner, so desperate, saw a glimpse of God and grasped onto it. And because I clinged onto Him, the one and only God, I have been lifted and saved. So my challenge is fairly simple. Um, stop clinging on to this world, because it's like a loose rock and you'll fall into it. Cling on to something that's a little bit more sturdy than a pebble. And for those visiting, please study the Bible. Um, if you don't want to, amen, I don't really care. But <laughs> study the Bible. You guys are going to fail if you don't. So with that, please bow your heads in a word of prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for thank you so much for the for the consistency that you are, Father God. Thank you for your strength, Father God. You really are the you really are the one and only God that anyone can cling on to. And it's such a it is such a comfort to realize that once we cling on to you, Father God, there is no there is no turning back. There is no there is never a, a falling moment with you, Father God. And I just pray that you know, despite all of our journeys, Father God, or wherever we come from, Father God, that we just we really cling on to you and realize how desperate we are for you. In your son's mighty name, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Oh, it doesn't sound like you guys are ready to give back to God. I said, good morning, church. Oh, there you 
you go, there you go. So uh, for those, uh, as you already heard, my name is um, Joe, AKA, um, AKA Yopo and um, Samun. So um, contribution is uh, where we give out of, um, you know, to give back to God, but also to give to pay those who are in the full ministry, like Nixon, um, Alejandro, and also our leaders here, you know, our amazing leaders who is always leading the church uh, in a loving way and also encouraging us to keep on fighting the good fight of the faith. And also, this is uh, just a reminder. It isn't about encouraging or challenging you guys, you know. Firstly, I just want to start off with a word of gratitude, to, you know, to thank you guys for keep on giving back to God. And, you know, to just select you guys up for your continuous effort in giving back to God and contribution. So, this is um, to motivate you, a reminder to motivate you and inspire you, you guys, to give back to God. So, turn with me to um, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 10. 16 verse 10. Sweet. Say amen if you're there. Amen. Amen. Oh, oh. Okay, I'll wait a few more minutes. Four seconds. Amen. <laughs> there you go. All right. And it reads. Then celebrate the festival of weeks to the Lord your God by giving a free will offering in proportion to the blessings the Lord your God has given you. See, contribution isn't just about giving to repay your favor to God, but give as a blessing from God so he, that can, so he can continue to bless you for each giving you guys do each and every week. See, it sort of uh, reminds me of back in Samoa with uh, this relationship I had with uh, my brothers named BJ and Lewis. You know, each week uh, we'd always go out and have food together, you know. Each week um, one of us had to shout, you know, one week will either be me, one week will either be another brother. You know, but um, doing that, uh, even though we were short on cash or a bit of broke at the time, you know, but we still did it anyways because of the bond and the relationship and doing it out of free will and joyful because it was fun. Because uh, I, you know, love doing it, you know, spending bond time with that brother and sister, uh, those brothers. So, so you know, it was, it was fun doing it each and every time, every week. You know, so in the same way, you know, uh, so, no, no, I'm saying. So the point is, is to show that giving each time in free will and out of a joyful yeah. means you guys are doing it out of heart. Yeah. No, so that's to help you to give out of your heart because that's what all God wants from you. Is your heart, yeah. not your money or anything that you give. You know. So my remi reminder is, let's be joyful about our giving today and to do it and to offer out of free will to God because you know He's our living God and always. So uh, all glory to God, and let's go into a word of prayer. Come on, Joe. All right. Dear Lord, Father God, truly grateful for this amazing morning and this amazing service as well, Lord, Father God, to be able to be all these amazing brothers and sisters, to be able to uh, fellowship and to hear your uh, words together, you know, Father God, so that we can be prepared together for the week to come, Lord, Father God, you know, be strengthened to help each other, to hold each other accountable. But I pray that you uh, be with their hearts, Lord, Father God, give them the joyful heart and the free will to give back to you, Lord, Father God, for all that you, uh, that you bless them with, Lord, Father God, by I pray for the rest of the service as well, for uh, Scotty to preach your word, Lord Father God. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. We all say, Amen. 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 All right. Uh, welcome to all of our friends and uh, families that are visiting. Uh, we are just going through uh, the lesson, so please uh, um, nudge the person next to you and they will email you what we have for today. Because there's a lot of passages we're going to cover through today. Oh. So let's go to God in a quick word of prayer. Father God. Thank you for this time. It's always a privilege and an honor to hear from you as we search through your word. As I know that uh, we come here today not only to worship you, God, but to be equipped from the insights, from the river of inspiration that is your word. I pray that uh, we can learn and we can absorb and we can take it in, Father, and apply it to our lives this week and each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. The church said, Amen. Amen. So today, guys, we're going to be talking about Abel. Woo! 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 Abel! Um, and uh, judging by the reaction, maybe you haven't read the story of Abel. Either way, we're going to cover him, uh, him today. The title of our lesson is simply this, Faith to Give God His Best. Abel, 
faith to give God his best. You know, when you don't give your best in something, it's simply because you don't have enough faith. Because you, you don't want to give your best in something that you don't know or you, you doubt you're going to be good at, right? So, uh, you know, uh, the, the sevens competition or training has started and Chris has uh, told everyone to come. And uh, some of us show up at 6 a.m. on a cold uh, Saturday morning. Some of us don't. <laughs> amen, amen. Vince is like, man, I only missed one. Uh, but, uh, you know, do you have faith uh, to give God your best today? Hebrews 11 verse 4, the Bible says, By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. You know, it's very interesting, right? Have you ever noticed that, it, that it's Abel, not Adam, the first man or person in the whole of faith? Where, now, people have wondered, why is that? Well, when you think about it, back in the time of Adam and Eve, they were walking in the garden. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 and 3 that they walked with God, meaning they saw God. They were with God in a sinless state at that time. However, when they were banished from the garden, um, you know, Cain and Abel were basically, or arguably, the first real human beings to have a relationship with God without seeing Him. So in other words, you can say that these men were the first to live by faith, not by sight. Now, here's a very interesting thing, right? Even when you take a look at it, we find and we know the story where Abel, you know, offers his offering and it's great. God is pleased with it. Cain offers his offering and yet, uh, God is displeased with it. And yet God only speaks to Cain and not Abel. Right? And what happens is, if you guys go to Genesis 4 verse 6 to 8, it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? So here, God has just rejected the offering of Cain, and now he's speaking him to hopefully help him understand, hopefully call out to him, uh, for him to, you know, at least place his faith in God and give his best the next time. But then he continues on, and then we know that he ended up killing his brother Abel. Um, and it's crazy because why is that so important? We find here God had to speak to this guy though he was disobedient. Yet for Abel, he was obedient and God ne didn't necessarily have to speak to him. Why? Because he was living by faith, not by sight. Uh, Abel's reward was life with God through death. What does that mean? His reward for offering what he had was death. Some of us, we still look at death like it's something of, oh, maybe I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to see that yet. God allowed Cain in order to kill Abel because he was ready to leave this world and be in paradise with God. He had proven himself worthy of being with God for eternity. Believe it or not, death is the reward of the righteous. Right? Death should fire you up, not make you sad. Death should be something that you want to run to, not something you want to run from. And very often, when uh, people are afraid of death, it mostly comes down to two reasons. Number one, it's because they don't know what's going to happen to them after they die, right? Or they kind of do like, I'm going to go to hell, you know? Or secondly, they're very attached to this world and the desires and the things that we have in this world. Even the relationships that we have in this world can be something that you can be attached to. However, for righteous people, they don't know the greatest thing we could ever have is a relationship with God. Um, so, you know, uh, Jen and I obviously uh, sent out an email. Jen and I are leaving for Chicago tomorrow. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to preach this lesson because I wanted to call the church to do their best, right? To give their best. And this is where we'll really see whether we are a church who really gives our best or just wait for our leaders to give their best. Yeah. Amen. Now, it's very interesting as well, because I was talking to Jen, I was like, man, when we get back, uh, we've got a lot of things we're going to sell. You know, sometimes as a disciple, you get to a point where I think you accumulate more than you realize, and it's like, yeah, honey, I think we've got too much right now, you know, in terms of possession. We need to come back, hop on Facebook Marketplace, and sell. 
But, but very often, I always go throughout my week, and I, you know, not always, sorry, but very often, I would say probably once a month and whatnot, I always kind of go back and reflect. It's like, man, if I were to die today, would I really say I'm ready? And sometimes I go back into my office or even office room, and I'm like, man, I feel like I've got too much. You know what I mean? Like, there's too much possessions, too much I've got. You know, maybe it's one pair of socks or three pairs of socks. Now I've got like four pairs of socks, you know. <laughs> maybe I might sell two, you know. And so I just need two. I don't know. My, my wife's not happy about that. But anyways, in 1 John 2 verse 25, the Bible says, and this is what he promised us, eternal life. You know, if there's one thing we can learn from Cain's life, is that we see that anyone who's half-hearted can often find the wholehearted people annoying or even offensive. Why? Because it exposes their lack of devotion and their righteousness, um, and it maddens their heart. So even this week, uh, there was this one guy, uh, I won't name his name, but apparently um, someone mentioned that he has been going around spreading some you know, rumors about us as a church or even as a group on campus. And then I was doing a Bible study, and all of a sudden he comes in and he sits with uh, Philip, he sits with Frank, and with Metu. And I was talking with uh, Frank afterwards, um, and he's like, yeah, he made it, seem, it made it seem like he was trying to attack Philip. And so I told Frank, I was like, look, next time you, something like that happens, you just take him head on. You just go, hey, what are you trying to do? So after Frank told me that, I got on the phone, phoned him up, didn't answer, texted him. And I was like, hey, would you like to meet up and chat? And he goes, sorry, I'm busy because you know I'm a student, so you totally can understand that. And I was like, oh, okay. So you're busy to meet up, but you're not busy to go and attack someone like Philip. You know what I mean? Um, so I was like, oh, nothing urgent, no worries. But um, it, it taught me something. It's like, that's how often religious people feel because they feel bad about the fact that you're so committed. They would try to go in there and in the name of God, try to pull people out while not necessarily understanding. They're just trying to cover for their own lack of devotion and commitment to God. But you know what? It was the same thing in Paul's day. In Acts chapter 26, verse 20 to 21, the Bible says, First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preach that they should, uh, don't tell people the truth and just uh, say that they're awesome and encourage them. And then hopefully play some really awesome music to have thousands and thousands of people come to church. <laughs> oh no, it's, it says they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews loved me and gave me some props and you know, on CNN they said we were the greatest church and what. No, it says the Jews seized me and tried to kill me. Do you know when you have faith like Abel's because you have persecution like Abel? All right? Do you have faith that brings persecution? Last night we had an awesome uh, marriage night. Uh, I don't know if you're excited about it, but we married a super encouraged and refreshed. Uh, we feel sorry for the zoos. Amen, Nixon, uh, hang in there. Uh, but it was awesome. The, the clades really uh, spoiled us. I mean, we had this awesome, like, you know, trifle, right? Have you try to imagine the best trifle you've ever had, right? Well, this one was like twice better than what you just imagined, right? I don't know what it tastes like, but it's better, you know? And then we had some ham, we had some chicken, uh, we had a wobbly table, but it was still awesome chicken and ham, you know? Um, and it was just amazing. And one of the things we were taught last night uh, in marriage is um, the, the idea that uh, the, the guy that was doing the lesson, he, he spoke and he goes, man, how often do you um, talk about your wife? the way that Jesus talks about the church. Because the Bible often uses marriage as like the comparison between uh, Jesus and the church. It's like, do you get persecuted for preaching about your wife? And so I'm like, okay, well, that's a, that's a new thing. You know, I've got to go on campus and tell people about my wife, you know. Um, but I'm excited. You know, we're going to get persecuted for telling, you know, for annoying people about our wives and our husbands. Amen. But, uh, you know, in the same way, we only share what we get excited about. And that's what we were taught last night. It's like, how excited are you about your relationship with God? You know, is it feeling a bit bland? Now, I think some of us walked into the room today and we're a bit bland in our relationship with God. Hopefully today will help you. You know, to follow Abel's heart is to follow the heart of Christ. Right? In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24, it says, To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You know, Abel and Jesus were both shepherds. They both died a natural death, 
Both were killed for their righteousness because of the jealousy of their brothers. Both were first born from among the dead. Abel sacrificed his firstborn lamb to God. Yet Jesus was the lamb of God and God's firstborn sacrifice. So there is a lot of similarities between Abel and Jesus. So as we learn from Abel today, we'll also be learning from the heart of Jesus. And the church said, Amen. Point number one, why is Abel in the hall of faith? Why isn't, why isn't Alejandro in the hall of faith? You know what I mean? Why is Abel in the hall of faith? Well, we'll learn. Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 to 5. Amen. <laughs> in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So why is Abel in the hall of faith? Well, firstly, Abel gave his best, not just some of the rest. Or in other words, in today's vernacular, leftovers, right? Unless it's pizza, I believe that God is not happy with anything else that's left over, you know? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. You know, it's very interesting here. When you look at the story, right? The first offering made to God revealed two hearts that I believe um, reveals all of the hearts that we have today in the world. Right? Um, Abel, we find here, has brought the most valuable part of his prized possessions, the fat of his firstborn, and Cain just brought some of what he had. Now, I always picture this. Sometimes when I read this passage, I always imagine someone, you know, eating like, I don't know if it's a fat of lamb or maybe like a steak fat, you know, and you just like crunch on it, you know, and that oil comes down, right? It's just like, it's kind of awesome, you know? <laughs> now, to be honest, you in the 21st century don't think that's awesome. You know why? Because you eat a lot of fatty stuff. In those days, guys, in those days, people were like ripped and people were starving. And so to have fat was like having trifle. Seriously, because they're so ripped, you know, like they don't, they rarely eat, ever, eat any fat or whatsoever. And so like they have metabolisms that were crazy, you know, it's like an, uh, 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 an engine running in a car kind of thing. And so to them, having like the fat of something like a lamb, that was pleasing. And so most people would want to go for that. However, for Abel, he decided to give it to God. You guys kind of get the gist now, right? You know. There are those that, like Abel, think that what they are doing, um, think about what they're doing, and when they bring their offering and to whom they are bringing it, what God means to them, how much He has given to them, and how much He deserves thanks and gratitude. You know, how often do you come to church and you really think about what you're doing? When you're singing to God, when you're praising God. Um, I think, you know, New Zealand is a very reserved kind of country, right? We come here, we sit, sit and we look at the lyrics and we just kind of mumble certain things and go, oh, well, I don't know the lyrics of the song, so therefore I can't really, you know, sing with all my heart. A bunch of rubbish. I was telling a brother earlier today, in Samoa, when I was in high school, we would get beaten. Uh, now, now, we won't do this in church, amen? But we would get beaten uh, if the prefect walked up and you're not looking at, or you're not trying to mumble the lyrics. Now, they didn't have any lyrics up on a board or up on a song sheet. They just, they, you just listen to how people would sing, and then you'd have to go, right? And if you don't do that, the prefect will come up and just slap you on the head, or I don't know, take you on the side and give you a little rough up, and then uh, bring you back into the assembly, right? Um, amen. Now people call it, call it abuse or something like that, but, <laughs> but uh, we call it man training, you know? Up to you, you know, if, if you're a Gen Zer or something like that, you know, maybe you'll think that way. But, but anyways, what it really did to us was it really helped us learn the lyrics quite fast. Because I was talking to one of the brothers and they were like, yeah, it's just hard because I don't know the lyrics. So I was like, bro, 
giving your best in singing means you just keep making mistakes. Yeah. And so what we would do is, if say, let's just say, for example, if we we're learning a song like Lead Me to the Rock. Lead me to the dance. Like, and then you get it wrong, and you're like, oh, dang it, okay, now I'm embarrassed. Let me learn it again. But there was no option of like not murmuring it. And what would happen is, because it's either you can just sit there and go, nom, 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 and then get your jaw really all worked up, or you can seriously be forced to kind of like learn the lyrics. <laughs> And you'd make a lot of mistakes, but what would happen is you'd learn it a lot faster. Why? Because you're giving all of your heart. Yeah. And I think sometimes as well with singing, we're just like, well, I'm just waiting until I know the lyrics. Well, you'll probably wait till you're dead, you know? <laughs> but how often do you think about what you do when you come to church, when you give contribution? You know, recently, uh, Jen and I were blessed to get some extra, uh, particularly I know the donees come out. Who's fired up to get that donee? Um, anyways, sorry, bro. Um, but... Uh, we just decided, no, we're going to give something. But first we decided, okay, we're going to pray and we're going to give to God. Like how often do you look at your contribution and go, does this really challenge me or, you know, is this okay? You know, can I give, how much more can I give? I was always inspired as a younger Christian. I heard of the sister that um, she sacrificed so much that one time she was like, I really want to raise my contribution. So she started to raise it like $3.4. I was like, I want to just give more, but I know this is what my budget can only allow me to. And then the next day, next week, it was like $4. Next day, it was like $2.50, whatever it is. But it's like, even for myself, I always look, man, how can I do better in my giving for God? You know, I know um, one, of the, one of the evangelists um, in, in our movement, his name is Chris Kopech. Now, you know, in this day and age, we have a lot of like transaction, right? Where we just like, uh, or put, a, put it on, uh, what's it called? When you send money automatically, um, like a direct debit, right? Where you do that and you just, yeah, you just directly transfer money. And uh, he said, um, he's still in this idea where he was like, I decide not to give any direct transfer because every single Sunday I want to come and sit on a chair. I want to feel that note that I'm giving and then I want to put it in an envelope and then I'm going to give it to God. Because he's like, man, I just, I just kind of want that emotional feeling like this is my giving to God. You know, do you feel like that when it comes to not only speaking, when it comes to song leading, when it comes to giving to God? However, there's also those that are like Cain who just give some, right? They only give it because they know it's the right thing to do, but they don't really think about what they're doing and who they're doing it for. In 1 John 3 verse 12, it says, Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. That's why he was in the hall of faith. Hebrews 11 verse 4 says, By faith he was commended as righteous. You know, being righteous is being in a right relationship with God. What does that mean? It means that God is right with you and He's happy with you. Yeah. And that He would not bring up with you the fact that you are treating Him badly, ignoring Him, sidelining Him, putting Him second. And that pleasing God has to be more important. Because we see the same thing in Abel's life. Yeah. You know, is that the most important thing in your life? If not, you will never learn to be in a right relationship with God. You know, I always have to help our religious people understand, you can be in love with someone, but totally not be in a right relationship with them. So it's like, for, for example, myself and my wife, right? I was already in love with Jenna before I got married to her. But I was only in a right relationship with her um, to receive any further benefits or, you know, when it comes to physical intimacy or whatever it is and whatnot. Simply when I decided to be right in marriage. Are you guys with me? Yeah. All right. Well, we see Cain was not. He gave his first fruits to someone else besides God. You know, I think about it. If he, didn't, if he only gave some of his first fruits, that means he would have given a lot of his other uh, fruits that was left over to either himself, his family, or maybe he fed it back into the agriculture business he was trying to start just so that he can get more crop. But whatever it is, that teaches us today in the same way. When our hearts are not given towards God, it means something else has our hearts. Or if our hearts are not fully towards God, something else has our hearts. So, you know, yesterday as well, I had a deep time with Job. And I appreciate his humility. I mean, that was a great contribution he did today. Um, but uh, I was sitting down with him and I was like, okay, so what do you think is something that you're learning from God at this point? And he goes, uh... I don't know. I, in Samoa, I was, I was, I was uh, discipled and I was told. And uh, I also do believe that I think God is really trying to get me to surrender 
to uh, live out his plan for my life. I'm like, okay, uh, and how are you doing with that? He's like, I'm working on it. I was like, okay, is there some struggles? Yeah, I'm struggling a bit to hold on to God's plan for my life. And then I sat down with him and I was like, okay, well, let's think about it. What other plans are there that's making you compete with God's plan? Like, what is it that you have in your life that you're planning to do aside from God's plan? He goes, that's a very good question. I never thought about that. It's like, I don't really know why I'm struggling, all right? But then I was like, well, here's the thing. We took out the scriptures, but we really had to help him get to a point where like, bro, you gotta really understand, what are the other things that are competing with your heart before God? You know, Cain did not learn from the sin of his parents or Satan, and, that the, and the fact that they took all the best fruits of the world for themselves rather than giving it to God. You know, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, it says, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness. You know, how often do you pursue to be right with God? You know, God also spoke well of his offering. In Hebrews 11, verse 4, it says, When God spoke well of his offerings, and he's talking about Cain, uh, sorry, Abel, and, um, and, and we find here that God looked at Abel's offerings and he was like, Man, this is, I just want to speak well of it. You know what I mean? You know, it's also whenever I hear the sisters talk about uh, the sister's household, you know, or the brothers, they're like, hey, I want to lift these guys up. So even yesterday we had uh, uh, Young Prophets. Uh, young Prophets is a young leadership group that I'm trying to raise up uh, to be leaders. And, um, and Fata was sitting there going, I don't know if I have good news. Oh, yeah, I've got good news. Pascal. Pascal's so cool, you know, he talks to me, he helps me, he's uh, funny, he's this and he's that. But it's like he spoke well of him and he's excited about it because it's how Pascal makes him feel. And in the same way, you gotta ask yourself, how, you know, based on how much you're giving your heart to God, how would you make God feel? You know, uh, we've got a, a little um, invite service coming up in two weeks. So today we're gonna officially launch it. So if you guys go on your OneNotes, there's a 2024 Auckland uh, tab that we have. And in that tab, we have our Love Your Neighbor service. So it's like a version of Bring Your Neighbor Day, you know? <laughs> uh, but instead of bringing your neighbor, I'm going to encourage you to go love your neighbor and bring them. Amen? Because love brings people. So we got our little invites here. Um, and uh, it's going to be on the 11th of August. We're going to have some food. We're going to have some fun. And we're going to have some fellowship. And we're going to start at 10 a.m. It's going to be right here. So on that table over there, we have all of our invites. If I could encourage everyone after the service, go grab a bunch and go give it to your neighbors. I've got a challenge for you guys. You know, um, invite all your neighbors that's around your apartment complex. Maybe even on your street. Invite everyone. You know, go in, you know, maybe uh, the first week, invite them. The second week, I want to challenge you. If you have a little bit of money, bake them something. You know, if you have a slice of bread, just go, hey, I've got a slice of bread here. Like, would you want some, you know? Uh, if you're a brother, don't do that. I think the sisters, they will make it all nice and, you know what I mean? Like, they'll add some raisins in it or, you know. But if you're a brother, don't do it. You know, give them the steak or something, you know? Um, but... You know, it, it's all about helping. We're going to be focusing on making this some theme service, encouraging those around us, and bringing them in so that we can help them come to God. Are you guys with me? Yeah. Point number two. How did Abel change a nation? Well, in short, Abel's giving set the standard for all time for all generations and for all people, especially God's people. You know, he taught us through all, um, you know, as you see throughout the, 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 the scriptures as it goes on, it's almost like God used Abel as a standard to go, man, if God can give it, sorry, if Abel can give his best, that means anyone else can do the same. You know, it's not in your uh, notes there, but if you guys turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. So here, and I want to make a point here about how um, Abel became the standard for all of us in today. Jesus here is talking to his disciples, and he goes in verse 28, he goes, Jesus said to them, 
Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So he's talking to his disciples here, and he's going, look, you guys will judge the go- God's people. And then on top of that, we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, uh, the Bible talks about that you guys, the Christians, will be the ones that will judge all of humanity. Now what does that mean? Very often, um, sorry, not very often, but what does that mean? We're not going to be sitting in heaven and go, okay, you're going to go to hell, you're going to go to heaven kind of thing. What the Bible is actually talking about is that our lives is going to stand as a judgment to all people. Right? The apostles' lives is going to stand as a judgment to the people of God. What does that mean? God is going to look at their lives and our lives and go, oh, well, they were able to do it. How come you weren't able to do it? You know, God will look at uh, your life and go, well, Abel gave his best and got killed for it. How did you go in giving your best and did you get killed for it? If not, why not? You know, then what are you complaining about? Are you guys with me? But I think very often, guys, we get so, we have a lot of excuses or reasons why we don't give God our best, right? Um, And I was trying to, and I remember I was studying the the Bible with a a religious person once, and I was trying to help him understand. Um, Are you there, Kevo? I was trying to help him understand, you know, this is the difference between uh, being religious and being righteous. So I've got like three different diagrams here. I appreciate uh, Kevo, not that one, but the other one. (laughs) Now, I was trying to help him understand, look, this is what it means giving God your best and giving God just some of the rest that you have. So in this diagram, if you guys can see, can everyone see it? So this is what it looks like to be religious, right? So firstly, you have a pie uh, graph there. Now, a religious person sections their life off in different ways. So you have God in the blue there, family, uh, and then you have work, and then you have university, then you have entertainment, then you have holiday, and then I forgot that one. Which one that is, uh, Kevo? Okay, amen. Never mind. And then you have relationships, right? And that's what it looks like to be religious. You section your life off. It's like God becomes a time in your schedule rather than God being your schedule. Now, this is the second bit, and this is what it looks like to be a super religious person. Right? 50% of it is towards God, and then you kind of spend less time with your family, less time for work, less time for university, entertainment, holiday, leisure, relationships, the list goes on. Right. Um, and that's what it means to be super religious. Some of us can be easily fall into this category. Right. And then comes along, this is what it means to be righteous. Nice. So if you can uh, enlarge that as well, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Why don't we give a round of applause for Kevin? <laughs> This is what it means to be righteous. Right. Where God covers everything or is in the center of your life. Mm-hmm. And so, so therefore your interests are influenced by God. Your church is influenced by God and His Word. Your studies are influenced by your commitment to God or a lack of. Your ministry, your work, your family. And whatever God decides to want to do with your family, you will do that too. Mm-hmm. And I think for some of us, we can be religious to the point where we go, wait, God can touch all these other areas of my life, just not this section. And we can become super religious without being righteous. Let me encourage you today. If you're struggling to give up a relationship for God, um, you are sectioning off God and becoming super religious without being righteous. But here's the thing as well. When you don't learn to give your whole heart to God who is perfect, you will never learn to give your whole heart to an imperfect human being because they will sin against you. And if your spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend uh, would not put God above you, they will eventually put someone else above you. When your beauty fades away, when your body fades away, when your money fades away, or even when your attitude fades away. I mean, we know, we who are married know what we know what we're talking about, you know what I mean? Sometimes uh, my wife has an attitude towards me, you know, and I'm just like, oh, amen. Sometimes I have an attitude towards my wife. And she's like, amen, honey, I think you need some time to go pray. <laughs> but sometimes we look at each other and we go, what happened to my wife? Like, this is not the moment, woman I married. It's like, what happened, what happened to all the encouraging attitude? It's like, no, it's just... That's what happens when you live with two sinners, right? Or that's what happens when the other person is more sinful, a.k.a. myself. Anyways, but, you know, what is your excuse for not giving your best to God today? Well, point number three, we'll close it off here. How can we imitate Abel's faith today? 
Well, firstly, you got to give the best of your heart, right? The best of your heart. When you look, take a look at Abel, although he gave to God the best materially, the real issue was his heart, right? There was no minister, there was no discipling, there was no leadership, there was no church building uh, to be committed to. He just like, no one had to tell him, like, this is how much you got to give. He was like, man, this is the best of what I have. Let me give it to God. Yeah. In Mark chapter 12, verse 29 to 31, it says the most important one to Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength and with all of you. Amen? Amen. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. You know, if we ever move away from the greatest commandment of loving God and being in love with God, um, we eventually become so numb and tired and bored of what we do as disciples. Yeah. You know, when you're genuinely in love with someone, nothing is too hard. You know, I know, uh, you know, uh, even now, like, I feel like I'm more in love with Jenna than I am, right? Um, I believe I do a great job of taking out the trash, amen? <laughs> amen? Honey, okay, sometimes, amen. But, Sometimes you fall short at times, right? And, uh, but very often, like even now, I'm just like, whatever my wife wants is like, okay, we're going to get that. We're going to get that. All right. Now, there are certain things where I'm like, okay, honey, no, let's take out the scriptures because we don't think we need that, you know? She's like, we need this. And I'm like, honey, we want it, not need it, all right? <laughs> but nothing is too hard when I'm in love with my wife. Nothing becomes too hard when we're in love with God. You know, where is your heart and love for God today? You know, I think one of the amazing things about human beings is that when we really give our hearts and our minds, nothing can stop us from achieving what we try to achieve. I mean, on Saturday, I, 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 I don't know what it was, but um, I had a blister on my foot, right? So uh, Chris was training the guys on Saturday morning, and we arrived, it was pitch dark, it was dark, it was cold. You know when you like, uh, it's so cold when you breathe, and it's almost like you're smoking, you know what I mean? That's how cold it was. And then like the, the grass was wet. I had a blister on my toe, and I was like, dang, I need to take off my shoes, because I'm, you know, I don't want it to get worse, and therefore won't be able to put on my shoes moving forward. And I decided to go bare feet and holy moly I've never experienced this before but I seriously felt like my toes were about to fall off I'm not exaggerating guys but I was running and I was just like I, the whole time I was running I was like how did Anu and Fata do this on the first day because on the first day they spent 45 minutes just running on the wet ground and I, as soon as I hopped in my car afterwards I turned on the heat and I directed it all to my feet because I was like and then I started praying it's like God please don't get me frostbite or anything please I want to keep all my toes you know I know I have problems with my toes but I want to keep them still you know and I was just like God please God please and then afterwards I was like I started feeling my legs it's like oh I can feel them you know they're, they're good they're good but I thought about it and I was telling Chris I was like man I am shocked at how like Fata and uh, Arnold could do that for like the whole training service uh, sorry training session that we had one time um, and it made me realize you know no matter what human beings give their hearts or minds to they will do an excellent job at it this can be an excellent church when everyone in this room decides to give their whole heart to it. Yeah. You know, I appreciate Philip. If there's one thing you will never find Philip lacking in, is 100% of his heart. Yeah. I mean, Philip will serve, Philip will slave away. I mean, uh, on Thursday, he literally almost couldn't breathe. He's like, <sighs> and, and, and uh, the boys were like, yeah, Philip, you need to go to sleep. You know, you need to go home. He's like, okay, okay. And, but he showed up to share. Um, and then yesterday I heard it was even worse. Um, and then on Saturday, we were waiting for everyone to arrive for sharing. And then lo and behold, Philip walks through. He's like smiling and he's still struggling to breathe. I was like, Philip, are you okay? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm here to share my faith. I'm like, Mac, you go, Philip. That's giving all your best. Um, you know, maybe sometimes you look at your fellow Christian next to you and you go, well, they don't really bring a visitor. You know, the question is, are you letting that influence you? And also, do you call out their lack of bringing people? You know, I think about uh, the Olympics is on. I mean, who's uh, checking out the Olympics at this time? <laughs> all right, all right. Some of you guys are not. Well, amen. Uh, but the Olympics is on right now. Amen. Vets is watching it. 
And it made me think of a story. And um, well, firstly, I, I, you think about the Olympics and you realize, man, every four years, people from around the world, human beings from around the world, most of them without the Holy Spirit, come together surpass normally their limits to crack records that everyone says is uncrackable or unbreakable. What does that tell you? These are guys that are like, man, we can do it as long as we set our hearts and minds to it. And I remember a story uh, from a while ago. Some of you guys may know the story, but uh, there's this guy named Roger Bannister. Has anyone heard of him? All right, Ian has. Amen. Uh, he's from around the 1950s, right? <laughs> Not my generation. I'm a part of the Gen Z, you know, I believe I'm in the Gen Z. <laughs> if there's ever a letter after the Z, I think that's my uh, generation. But anyways, in 1954, um, before that, and even in that year, scientists, biologists, and even world athletes, they believe that it is impossible for a human being, like literally impossible, physically impossible, uh, emotionally, mental, mentally impossible, to run one mile under four minutes. Um, and they said the only possibility of you running one mile under four minutes is that number one, it's got to be 10, 20 degrees Celsius, right? Not too hot, not too cold, just good enough, you know? The sun's got to be shining. Thirdly, the track has to be dry and hard. And then lastly, they said there's got to be these thundering crowds. And it's got to be a massive event with a massive stadium that people are just urging on this human being going, go, 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 you know, with loud music, just really spurring him on to go above and beyond what the human body can do. And then funny enough, in the 5th of May, 1954, a guy named Roger Bannister ran on a cold day on a wet track, a very wet day as well, in a small event in Oxford, England, and he ran 3.59 minutes in a mile. 42 days later, an Australian runner cracked it to 3.58. One year later, three runners broke it all in one race. And now 50 years later, thousands and thousands of people still break it today, knowing what was impossible since then. You see, whatever you set your heart and mind to, you can surpass what you think can hold you back. And I hope you're fired up about that, because I'm fired up about that. You go, Roger. Amen. Um, but you know, it's about giving your best to God. Or it's a shame this came. Are you pursuing God wholeheartedly or living your religion in vain? You're either all in for God or He does not know you at all. Forgiving everything means everything or from, from God's grace you will fall. God never came second in any race that He ran. He expects to train with the first group, be it in heaven or with man. Detach yourself from this world. Give your best to God, not you. Then you will become his first fruit, living in paradise with God and Jesus too. Let's give our best to God. To God be all the glory.